three candidates, all picked by this guy from Wasserman, from Martha's Vineyard. No local candidates, even though there was great public expression of de or desire for a local candidate. So I think the whole process is faulty, and I think they should start all over again, rather than just give it to a guy by default, simply because the other two guys left. There's not much of a mandate. It's partly in the hands of Wasserman, or I mean, what's, no, what's it's his... totally in the hands of Buttigieg at this point. Wasserman has total control over who the candidates are, and that's 99 percent of the game. So basically, it's like it's like a political election, where you have to choose between a Democrat and a Republican, and the Democrats and the Republicans generally get together and they agree that there are certain issues we are not going to address. Welcome to Citizens for Community Media. This is Peter Helland with uh, Robert Smith, Mario Sims, and E. Michael Jones. Uh, we do something different on this show, um, which the title of it is going to be something like um, re-examining Mayor Pete and his years in office. Uh, but we're going to start out by showing an old clip that we just found, and it was with uh, Robert, Mike, and I. It was December of 2012. <clears throat> and we had already done a show in your office, the one before, which we're still looking for that tape. Uh, but the one we did had a lot of discussion on the aftermath of Mayor Pete's firing of Chief Boykins and who he was going to pick. Okay, and what we didn't say in there is that uh, they had a town hall meeting to decide um, what kind of police chief do you want? Okay, and it only got to the first question, which was, do you want a police chief from South Bend or from outside the city? So a couple weeks later, they gave us the three candidates that they were going to look at, and they were all from outside the city. And Even though the people said they wanted a local candidate. Frank, front page of the paper said unanimous, they want a local candidate, right. And so then we are in this 11-minute clip that we're going to watch. We're examining uh, those three candidates. And we mentioned um, uh, Teachman, who ended up getting hired. Okay, but it, this is going to lay a good foundation for our discussion because uh, Mario is really good on the tapes and what's happening. In fact, uh, something just occurred today that you're going to say. Correct. Okay, and then I'm, my emphasis is on, yeah, who did he replace him with? Okay, so everybody has some good emphasis sure. here. Sure. So uh, let's watch this clip from December of 2012, and the show then was called uh, um, Public Access Michiana, which we changed to Citizens for Community Media. Good evening. This is Public Access Michiana, and we have the same guests, Bob Smith and E. Michael Jones, as we did last week. And the scripture we read last time is still relevant uh, to what we want to discuss tonight. So let's just refresh it. Uh, we started out with Palm Sunday. Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy, and it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, To the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And they laid out the palms, and they were excited. The Messiah had come. The fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies was at hand. And one week later, everything turned around. And here's what we read. For Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they, the religious leaders, had delivered Jesus up. And then it says, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And it's assumed that a large part of that crowd was this, was present when Jesus when when Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy riding on the donkey. Why did they let themselves be persuaded to change their mind about Jesus? And if we're ignorant of those forces out there trying to persuade you, uh, if you're ignorant, my people perish for lack of knowledge. The Christians are constantly, if they're um, being led by the Holy Spirit, we're constantly trying to persuade people of Christ. But the enemy is also out there laying out his seed and trying to persuade people away from Christ and to release, instead of Christ, 
that Barabbas spirit. And um, Mike has even written a book <laughs> on, on uh, that revolutionary spirit that the other side is persuading people to go to. And the relevancy of this time is, is that we were analyzing a police chief coming into town. And since the last show, we've had something new. We had three candidates. Uh, I don't think we knew that before. No, we didn't. And I did a little research, and we tried to do some research. It was interesting that we, uh, some of it, it wasn't as much on the internet as we, we got. We got three, three different candidates. Uh, two of them uh, were exactly what we feared during the last program. The one uh, was uh, worked with the FBI and is an expert in terrorism. Has no relevance whatsoever to South Bend, Indiana. Okay, we don't have any terrorist problem here in South Bend, Indiana. The other one uh, was of the same stripe, uh, a guy who works for something called the Convergence Group, which is something like Blackwater. The, I think it was the Emergence oh, Group. Oh, I'm sorry, Emergence Group. Out of, out of Washington, D.C. Which is uh, something like Blackwater, which is basically a mercenary operation that establishes police forces in conquered provinces like Bosnia, Herzegovina. And this man had experience setting up a police department in a conquered province. So if you're viewing South Bend as a conquered province, this is exactly the right guy. But I don't think that's the way most people view this. Uh, and so... I think we were prophetic, in a sense, in predicting the type of person that was going to get nominated. Uh, we, no one knew. Now we know. But there's even a, a, a more recent development, and apparently uh, two of the three candidates have dropped out. Yes. Uh, uh, recently, as, as last night on the news, uh, it was reported that one of the two has dropped out. And, and, and then earlier this afternoon, there was a rumor that the second candidate has dropped out, uh, which brings to question um, uh, why did those two candidates make the list and, and did the consulting firm uh, call those three, the top three, or did someone from the mayor's office make the choice of making the uh, three on the list the top three, but uh, uh, facts have shown that all three aren't going to make it. One has definitely dropped out. Or is it the two that I just mentioned? The, yes. the, the, the black guy who was the FBI agent? Yes. And the guy who works for the emergency group? So yes. that's good. Well, that's good yes. news. They, they're the, they were the candidates we wanted least uh, for South Bend, Indiana. I right. Mean, and, they, and if, they, and if that, our show last time had some kind of influence, then they could see that we were going to, no, not just us, but there was a potential that people weren't going to let up. Well, I th the other thing is I think that we have to point out, uh, we mentioned social engineering the last time. Social engineering doesn't work if you know that it's social engineering. It has to be invisible. We have to believe that it's just forces of nature that are throwing these, you know, like the black people against the Lithuanians in Chicago. You know, it's just a force of nature. Nobody's manipulating. As soon as you realize someone's at the top manipulating it, then it doesn't work anymore. Well, so you, it may, may that may be simply because we shone the light here on what I think the real game was. Maybe that ruined the whole operation. I don't know. Well, I, the, the fellow from Washington, D.C. with the emergence group, uh, Teachman, worked for a guy named Jim James Kretzker or something. I can't Krejci. Krejci, okay. Krejci is a dual citizen. He's, of? He, uh, Switzerland in the United States. Okay. In the 90s, he went over to Russia and, f and uh, founded, helped found, the chief financial officer, helped found a major TV network system there, which now is run by one of the, one of the oligarchs, which could be like one of these Russian Jewish mafia cartel over there. Yeah. Uh, but this is who that Teachman works for. So his, the fellow that Teachman works for is like got very suspicious global connections. Well, I think these, these hired police forces are not in what we want here. We don't want hired mercenaries coming in and policing it. That's for conquered provinces. That's not for a people who govern themselves. So it's, they're totally inappropriate. The, whoever made the decision made a completely wrong decision, and th they showed their hand about what they think about South Bend, Indiana. 
they think of it as a conquered province that's going to have this type of uh, commissar who's going to come in and run it. That's not what we want. Well, we could have easily have had it, at least in their minds. We could have. They, they certainly thought that this was... All, all I'm saying is whoever made this decision had the, all the wrong criteria, and that became apparent when they showed their hand and they showed the three candidates. Totally uh, inappropriate for our situation. And they were expecting nobody to notice. Right. I think that was the... Well, the, uh, the conventional accounts, none of this came out in the conventional accounts. So it just shows you that there's a big vacuum here in terms of news and the transmission of news, and more importantly, the analysis of the news, which just doesn't happen here. And there's a vacuum of enough men that have dedicated themselves, which every Christian should be dedicated, to, to analyzing things that need to be analyzed. Right. Right. I mean, if you were a pastor in a church and, and uh, you went on leave for a while and you said, well, I'm going to have somebody else preaching, and, he, and he's preaching heresy, uh, well, wouldn't you be, uh, why did you let that happen? Right, and, and also, back to your um, our scripture there, um, uh, people will uh, try to negatively influence other people just for their own envy or their personal gain. And in uh, this case, as has been shown through history, sooner or later, the truth is going to come out. But the problem is, there has always got to be someone or some group there that is willing to question the decisions such that people can start thinking. And, 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 and this type of selection process, it was faulty. And, and, and the uh, uh, candidates who were on the list were not what's needed as policemen for a city that is self-governed in a country that is self-governed. Um, uh, we are not at war. Um, or conquered. Right. Uh, so, um, so the reduction in the list is a good thing. Right, and so the, and the other fella is, is more acceptable. I mean, he, See, he, he was the least objectionable, let's put it that way. I don't know whether he gets it by default. Do you get it by default if the other two guys? Or just the whole process, or is the whole process going to be called into question if two people leave before the selection takes There's place? There's really no choice. You don't have a choice. Right? Uh, it, it was very little choice to begin with. Three candidates, all picked by this guy from Wasserman, from Martha's Vineyard. No local candidates, even though there was great public expression of de or desire for a local candidate. So I think the whole process is faulty, and I think they should start all over again rather than just give it to a guy by default simply because the other two guys left. That doesn't really... But it's That's in, not much of a mandate, it seems to me. Right. It's partly in the hands of Wasserman, or I mean, what's, no, what's it's his, totally in the hands of Buttigieg at this point. But, it, but, but, but who Wasserman, was Wasserman? Wasserman has total control over who the candidates are, and that's 99% of the game. So basically, it's like it's like a political election, where you have to choose between a Democrat and a Republican, and the Democrats and the Republicans generally get together and they agree that there are certain issues we are not going to address. So the one in recent memory was uh, uh, Clinton and, uh, and Bush over um, NAFTA and GATT. The two parties were conspiring together to keep that out. No one was allowed to talk about that. It has had a horrendous effect on American manufacturing. We've lost hundreds of thousands of jobs because of it. And the, the OK, I think we're on the air here. Um, was that helpful a little bit? Now, let me, let me, let, before, let me just jump in on what happened so the people watching. Sure. Okay, so there were three candidates, two dropped out, and it was a little bit confusing. The truth is, Teachman did not drop out. Did not drop no, out, and he was the bad wrong. guy, and we were kind of <coughs> wrong. We were wrong. So they did wrong. hire Teachman, and Teachman lasted until, I think, about September 2015. Now, something happened then, and... Uh, Bob might know a little bit about it because in, in September of 2015, I went to a, a conference, and I think you knew about this. And um, this was that you had international people at this conference, and the issue was the Israelization mm -hmm. happening in Gaza. In other words, it was a Middle East uh, peace conference dealing with Gaza, 
and they were talking about how the Israelis were so um, uh, mistreating the people in Gaza. Well, during this, and we had a lot of people from South Bend, you had a lot of people from the mayor's office, okay? And so I mentioned, I'm in the Martin Luther King's Club, and we were, concer we're concerned about the mayor, and we're concerned about the police chief, mm -hmm. that, not just us, but a lot of people, but about how he mm -hmm. was imposing this Israelization upon South Bend. In other words, everybody was marveling at how they were pointing out all the evils of Israel there, and I'm saying, they're considering us a, a conquered province. They're considering us this. And I was watching the faces of some of the people in the mayor's office, and it was like they were getting the message. Ten days later, mm -hmm. Teachman is fired. Right. Okay, we, I don't know why he was fired. I just know from my perspective, that's what happened. And uh, significant people from the mayor's office. Well, let's take credit for getting him fired. Let's not beat around the bush here. We did it, fellas, because we exposed what was going on. That was toxic to that, to that. Even though I got the guy's name wrong, I got the wrong guy, but the, the, the plan was there. It was, you're treating South Bend like a conquered province. You mean there's nobody in South Bend who's qualified for this job? This is the, the, exactly the situation. This is Pete Buttigieg in a nutshell. Pete Buttigieg is the perfect candidate. What we need is to fire the voters of Indiana. Wait, wait a minute, stop here. This man is supposed to represent us. He's not supposed to impose some type of oligarchic agenda on us. And I, this is, we've been saying this now for, for seven years now, and I think now it's finally getting national traction. Because there was an article in, first of all, he had his, press, he had his fundraiser in Napa Valley. Two billionaires from Napa Valley with a dining room with a Swarovski chandelier. Bad optics. Nobody's supposed to be in there, but somebody got in there with a camera. Well, what have we been saying all along? This man is the, the oligarch's candidate. He is incapable. He is, he is constitutionally incapable of representing anybody but his own ego. His, his life is one big resume building operation. He could not represent the people of South Bend because the, the, the litmus test was, are you on board with the homosexual agenda? If you're on board, then you're one of us. We're, we're, you're, you're a great guy. I'm a grassroots guy. As soon as you object, you're no longer a citizen of South Bend, Indiana. You're a fringe activist, which is the phrase he used to describe me in his biography. Guy lives on the same street. I live on the same street with him, but I'm not going to be represented unless I go along with this agenda. The point I'm trying to make now is this is now going national. There was an article in the New York Times just yesterday uh, saying, Pete, uh, he does, he, this is 10 years ago. This is a man who does not represent the state of the Democratic Party today. What you were seeing 10 years ago is this Oh, this, this alliance here between the oligarchs and the homosexuals. That is the state of the art ruling class arrangement in our day. It is also state of the art psychological warfare against countries like Ireland, which was taken over by, the, uh, by this, this type, this com combine of big corporations, tax exempt foundations, and, and tie tech firms like Google. They combine, they use the homosexual as their proxy warrior, as their human shield, and they come in and they overturn your government. Well, he did it in South Bend. Yeah. And the same, the year after he did it in South Bend, they did it in Indianapolis, where the, the government passes a law and then suddenly the CEOs come in and say, well, you can't discriminate against homosexuals, you have to overturn the law. That is getting out. And I think that we have to, I mean, who stood uh, who stood in the breach here when everybody just fell over and played dead? Who stood there? Who was on the steps? Yeah, it was. We were you, there. Yeah, the three of us were sure. We were there yeah, exactly. on the steps of that church exactly. calling this guy out. And this, 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 this reporter says to me, how does it feel to be on the wrong side of history? 
Obergefell, the Supreme Court just passed Obergefell. For once in my life, I had the right comeback. I said, son, if there's one institution that's been on the wrong side of, you, of history, it's been the Supreme Court. Have you ever heard of the Dred Scott decision? And everybody laughed at that point, you know? But I mean, this is, this, what, what we're seeing here is that the story, the local story that we've been saying for years is now coming into national focus. This is the issue. Go ahead. No, that's because he has now uh, stepped onto the national stage as a presidential candidate, uh, meaning Pete Buttigieg. Uh, and it's interesting that you, because you've, you've said that all along, that what's happened is the homosexuals have replaced uh, black people. I guess the, lar the large number of black people uh, in, correl in correl if you compare the number of black people, which is probably, I don't know, 24% of America, some number like that, to 4% of America is homosexual. It's too, un two percent. it's too unwieldy. So I tell you what, let's have a minority that we create, let's co-opt civil rights, and let's now assign it to 2% because we can control 2%. Right. Okay? So that's essentially what has happened. Uh, uh, and, 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 and to make it even more uh, appetizing, let's have our candidates say he's a Christian, and uh, he's gay and God made him that way. So now you have so many immature Christians that are saying, hey, he's a Christian, what's wrong? So, but, but I mean, this is, really, th this is really an amazing time, not only in South Bend, but America. It's an amazing time in South Bend because we've seen as he's thrust on, put onto the stage nationally, you, you've seen the, the national media sanitizing probably one of the most damaging, potentially, uh, uh, and explosive uh, uh, problems that he have, which is the South Bend police tapes. Uh, Cliff Notes version is sometimes, which ties into the police chief and Teachman coming in. When uh, the mayor took office in January 1st of 2012, there was a black police chief. He was beloved. A lot of people loved him. Even the white officers would tell you he was firm but fair, loved him. No problem. The community, it was one of those uh, situations where the community and uh, the rank and file agreed that Chief Boykins was a good chief. Well, what happened was, uh, along about March of 2012, the Director of Communications for the South End Police Department, uh, in, in, in her role as Director of Communications, maintaining the police lines, uh, came across some recordings. In those recordings, she heard uh, at least four officers discussing uh, their plans on removing Chief Boykins because one of the major campaign supporters of Pete Buttigieg was also a campaign supporter or a financial supporter of one of the officers. In fact, he later ran for sheriff and only lost by 18 votes. But in addition to hearing these, them planning on getting Chief Boykins replaced, and in, in, in their words, I'm paraphrasing, wouldn't it be fun when white people control the police department again, which is what one of them said, um, in addition to uh, you know, racially disparaging other members of the South Bend Police Department who have to be black, but they're also plotting crimes, including planting evidence on black defendants and those type of things. Mrs. DePape heard that. She then took the recordings, took it to Chief Boykin and li had him listen Chief Boykin's thinking, you, you have to hear this, Mayor Buttigieg. So he schedules a time to go to Mayor Buttigieg. Mayor B Buttigieg decides to uh, ask him to resign. And I think he resigned and then thought, that, well, I didn't do anything. He calls back the next day mm -hmm. and says, I'm not resigning. So he's demoted from chief to captain. Buttigieg says, the reason I, do, I did it is to stave off a federal investigation, which is absurd. It's like robbing a bank and the feds come and say, you know, President Peter, your teller robbed the bank and if you just fire her, we're not, we aren't going to prosecute her. That's the type of nonsense that Buttigieg started to disseminate. So, so we have the tape situation. That was 2012. Uh, uh, Boykins uh, is now a captain. Okay, this is the paper. In fact, she was on the radio today, give the first interview uh, na nationwide. She was on for half an hour and she explained that um, that what had happened was just what I said. She's in her role as the 
you know, director of communications, maintaining lines. She said that we weren't, we don't record people, we record lines. And she said the reason the lines are recorded because sometimes citizens will call in they'll, and then they're not happy with an officer, they'll file a complaint. Well, we can go back and listen to the tape and find out what happened. That's what that was. It was nothing sinister. She said this had been in place for a long time before Chief Boykins got there, who was, who was blamed for the recordings. He had nothing to do with it. He was just continuing his system. In fact, she said that even after uh, Mike Schmuel, the mayor's chief of SMA, uh, staff, called her in, who's now the mayor's campaign chair, called her in and demanded she quit, she said, why? Well, why? I mean, this this went on before all I'm doing is doing my job I thought you would like to hear what was going on uh, and and then uh, ultimately Rich Hill who is an outside private attorney fired her which she thought was kind of interesting she said I'm fired by somebody that's not even working for the city um, but but make a long story short the, the point that she wanted to make is that there was corruption on that tape there was racism on that tape and that there's absolutely no reason for the mayor not to play those tapes. Now, this is important because he has said over and over again for seven years since 2012, I'd, I'd like to play the tapes, I'd like to know what's on the tapes, uh, but I can't because it's against the law. What, what Mrs. DePape said today was, I mean, it was just, she destroyed that argument. She said, well, when the FBI uh, concluded their investigation of the tapes to determine if there was wiretapping, which they found there was none, they gave the tapes back to the city. So if it was illegal to obtain these tapes, certainly the FBI wouldn't have given them back to the city. And furthermore, she said that during the discovery process, the city attorneys and the private attorneys from the other side, because there were suits, as you can imagine, filed, asked her what was on the tapes. Now, she said, you know, I heard race, racist uh, comments and uh, illegal activity. So what you have now is a presidential candidate who is lying to the people, saying that I can't play the tapes, when well, there's no legal impediment to playing the tapes. Mrs. DePape, at, at the end of her, uh, her live interview today, was asked, well, you know, the former chief executive of the city of South Bend, the mayor, Pete Buttigieg, is now running for chief executive of America as the president. Would you vote for him? And she said, and she was just so honest. She said, you know, my husband Rick and I voted for him originally. We were, so, we were excited. We thought this was a breath of fresh air. But, but, you know, after what I know happened, and he continues to say he can't play the tapes, when there's no reason he can't, then I wouldn't vote for him because he has bad character. As a pastor, that, every, we've been fighting for the tapes to be played for 12 years not because I don't like Pete Buttigieg. When you start with scripture, I have to smile because I don't have an opinion of anyone. I, whatever God says is the truth, is the truth to me. So I go to Amos 7, which God uses as the plumb line, and I place a plumb line to the mayor. And the plumb line shows that not only is his character off by the lies he's told that are not supported by the law, or the facts why the tapes can't be played, but also the fact that when he makes a statement that God made him this way to justify his homosexuality, when it's clear in the first book of the Bible that God made male and female, you know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And it's that type of thing that's not only devious, it's destructive, Mike. And it's being now it's thrust onto the world stage. It's destructive because you're picking and choosing the moral law. Yes. You're, you're picking which commandment you're going to obey, and you're setting an example because you're the, rep you're the, the head of this city. And so that means that other people can say, well, I'll, okay, I'm just doing what Pete says. He's got that one. I don't want to follow this one. You're, you're creating a kind of moral subversion of the entire community because of the bad example that you're giving. Yes. But the other point that I wanted to make was that in this time period, the article came out in the uh, Young Turks uh, about, uh, it turns out that the guy was, who's backing, the big backer, the big cheese here, the yeah. kingmaker in St. Joseph County. Bob Urbanski is, is a major funder. Was supporting Pete to go in and take out Boykin. And the reason was he wanted uh, uh, his guy, Tim Corbett, who was on the tapes and saying that, hey, our guy 
uh, Mr. Obansky, who Tim Corbett has been disciplined for using his badge to go across state line to collect a bill from a businessman for Bob Urbanski. Uh, and, and the plan was for, um, uh, for Boykins to be fired and Tim Corbett to be made police chief until the, this information on the tapes were, was exposed. Now, ultimately, Corbett won, ran for sheriff and almost won two years ago. He lost by, I think, 18 votes. Right, right. But I'm interested in, in hearing Bob, because Bob yeah. knows uh, almost uh, everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just to back up some, um, uh, our listeners may not have the uh, background, so I would like to give a little of the background sure. on, the, um, um, on the demotion of Chief uh, Boykins. Like the reason the mayor gave was that Boykins was being investigated by the FBI Correct. such that he wanted to spare Boykins from, from that investigation such that if he was fired, he then would be spared. Now, this turned out to be a lie. As a matter of fact, the district attorney from Chicago sent a letter. David Capps, right. right. Right, to the city council stating, we are not investigating Chief Boykins, right. you know, such that that lie was, um, well, it came out such that everyone knew it, you know. Now, the tapes, those lines, those are the different phone lines mm -hmm. that people can call in. That taping system was in place right. years That's before right. Boykins was the chief. That's correct. Right. Years. It was there years just before Hurley was the chief, right. you know. That taping system goes back more than 30 years, you know, such that to, to, to put the um, uh, fault um, on the young lady, uh, uh, Karen, DePay, Karen DePay, right. who was fired, that was also wrong, you know. Now, um, uh, now uh, with uh, uh, Teachman, who replaced Boykins, one of the things that he was known for was to separate people as though they were in a conquered country. <laughs> physically separate them and to physically punish them. Something Teachman did as he visited uh, the um, African American churches and other groups was to take with him chains. Uh, Shackles, right. you know, exactly. shackles used to uh, 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 shackle a person's legs, arms, and waist. Not small shackles, but huge shackles. And he told the um, uh, audience at each place, this is what you will wear if you don't get in line. Now, that's simply threatening people. That is uh, just what Mike has been saying here, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Our, our friend, Mr. Jones, has been saying here, you know. So, so um, uh, Teachman also helped to bring in um, something called Shot Spotter, mm -hmm. which is a uh, system that will automatically uh, um, give location of where a gunshot has been heard. That way, no one has to call 911. The police uh, come to that location. And now, Teachman, when he, he resigned, that's the company that he went to work for such that a person could conclude that he was already working for them as the $600,000 shot spotter system was installed here. 
Now, he should have been just investigated before he left, you know, but, uh, but he wasn't, you know, you know. So, so, um, so during the time that Pete was mayor, there was lots of construction in the city, lots of business, just investment, but, but we have some negative things that uh, happen. The demotion of Chief Boykins, the firing of uh, uh, Karen, and also some activities that just did not sit right with people. And then the politics of it, um, uh, if you're for him, you think it's great. If you're against him, like you think it's uh, bad. But using the plumb line, mm -hmm. this example, you have to look at the facts and then work with the facts. Now, homelessness and people looking for jobs, those are still the number one items here in South Bend. What has been done to help people who are homeless? What has been done to find people jobs? Now, low level entry service jobs, those are plentiful. Middle level management jobs or high paying um, technical jobs, they're out there also, but the African American population is not benefiting from those. Also other parts of the population is not benefiting from those either, you know. So the question is why? The, because many people come from out of town in order to take those jobs. If you look at the uh, housing that has been developed, a developer by the name of Dave Matthews has built many units of expensive apartments and condos who can afford to live there, you know? It's not people who live in South Bend. It is people coming from out of town, such that the positions are there for people to uh, get, but they are not getting those jobs, you know? Bob, you, you look at 36% black poverty. Yeah. Um, so a little over a third of your black population, and this is supposed to be a progressive Democrat, Pete Buttigieg, 24% uh, uh, black unemployment. Uh, you, you're talking yeah. about homelessness. Dave Matthews, uh, the city every year seems to be shocked and surprised that there's winter. And so what happens along about August, September, there's this discussion of where, what are we going to do with the homeless? Where are we going to hold what's called weather amnesty, mm -hmm. which is open from 8 o'clock at night until 8 in the morning. And it's limited to how many beds. It's, let's say it's 30 female beds and 30 male beds. There are many more. Our church has, uh, for the last six years, uh, have specifically housed and dealt with, fed, clothed, and ministered to the homeless. So the, the thing that you can only have 60 beds at night, okay, is, is just, it's r ridiculous. But anyway, so every year, along about August or September, there's this discussion in the city council we need to house the homeless at Weather Amnesty. Where are we gonna put them at? Last year, Dave Matthews was paid over $120,000 to, to use a small part of his, a factory that he had, or a, a warehouse that he had. Not the whole warehouse, but two or three rooms in a warehouse that, don't, that limited the capacity to, to 30 men, 30 women. Uh, Weather Amnesty is supposed to be ready November 1st because it starts getting cold then. It wasn't ready until December 1st because of some uh, uh, permit issues that they have. So for 30 days, you have people pitching tents. Weather Amnesty then, uh, Dave Matthews was paid over $100,000 uh, for, it, it, did, it was supposed to start in November. The building wasn't open until the end of November, beginning of uh, December. It was supposed to remain open uh, April 15th. April 1st, it closed for cleaning for two weeks. So he gets paid, but here's the thing, every year this happens where a, a favorite son organization 
or a f crony of the mayor surfaces and says, you can use my facility. The city gives him a hundred more thousand dollars for four or five months. And then it reverts back to the owner's control. Okay. And then the city, the next year, August, September, what are we going to do with the homeless? No, no permanent plan. What? In addition, Ivy Tech had the uh, trailers. Um, um, six trailers that were in good shape that they donated to the city. The plans were to make those just available for homeless people and to uh, put beds in there uh, 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 and to have running water. Those trailers have sat for so long that the city now has to basically scrap them and it's going to cost them more than $30,000 just to scrap them, you know, such that they could have been put to good use for the homeless. Now, now these are six double wide trailers. They were used you know, for classrooms. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, such that they were, well, <clears throat> well, an opportunity was missed, uh, uh, but um, um, I think uh, Mike was on a good track about uh, how the, um, the position of people and their beliefs affect the way they govern. It's because you can um, um, look at how foreign countries have been impacted. Now, yes. now yes. the fundraiser you mentioned, that Yesterday was the last fundraiser that Pete has had. Now he has had others, but the last one it was so extravagant that it did make nearly every newspaper in this country. Now they didn't have all the pictures, some only had the words, but, but you have to look at where his support is coming from. You get the impression that, that there's a caste system. This, this is exactly what we need to address. Yeah. If this man arrives here, and he announces that he's a homosexual, he is creating what we would call homosexual privilege. Right. Okay, that you don't have to be a homosexual to have homosexual privilege, it helps. Okay, but you have to be part of this progressive uh, cadre, and this city becomes then a magnet that draws in these people from someplace else, and they get put in positions of power, and then the, the local people become second-class citizens. This is the end of representative government. Absolutely. It is not just happening here. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Exactly the same thing happened in Ireland over a period of about 10 years, beginning with the big uh, transnational corporations come in, a lot of them pharmaceutical firms, okay? They, uh, they bring in uh, tax exempt foundations. The tax exempt foundations create NGOs that start creating armies, militias of basically militant homosexuals, Antifa, whatever you want to call them, people that can be mobilized like that because of the internet. And then you bring in Google and big tech technologies and you put all these groups together and they have basically conquered Ireland. They have conquered a country. Not one shot was fired. It was all state-of-the-art information technology that basically turned the Irish people into second-class citizens in their own country. This is exactly what happened in Indiana. It's exactly what happens when you, in a place like South Bend, when you bring in some representative of the oligarch system, you bring him in, he's disguising you or using this whole homosexual thing as a, 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 a camouflage for the fact that these people are taking over your city, yeah. they're putting their people in charge of your city, and you're becoming a second-class citizen here. You know, I, I saw it play out with RIFRA, Re, uh, Religious Freedom Res uh, Restoration Act, when, uh, uh, when Mike Pence, now Vice President but Governor, I happened to be down at the city capitol in Indianapolis. I went in his office and prayed for him. There was so much pressure uh, placed on Mike Pence. When I went to his office, there must have been 70 to 80 cameras 
from all over the world. This is where you had the large corporate presidents flying in That's right. and saying, you, you know, uh, drop Salesforce. it. Salesforce. Right, exactly. Scott McCorkle. And this, it, essentially strangle, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the flow of cap, capital into Indianapolis, uh, in, in, uh, into Indiana also, because Mike Pence had dared to uh, speak on behalf of the Religious Freedom Res Restoration Act, RIFRA, and he killed it. And I remember seeing Mike Pence literally in, excuse me, in tears as I prayed for him. And he, if you remember, he, he, his knees buckled. And I can, I can tell you that I went down there as a representative of the Indiana's Pastors Alliance, and they were just livid at, at Mike Pence. We kept saying, we'll stand with you, we'll stand with you, and, and he just buckled. And we saw then these corporate presidents were flying in. They weren't even residents of the state of Indiana, no. but they changed the course of legislation in Indiana. They, that's over, the, that, they overthrew the government. That's exactly it. They over, so, so if, if Pence, I mean, okay, we all, you know, it's easy with hindsight. We can all be Monday morning quarterbacks. But all Mike Pence had to say to Scott McCorkle was, what part of Indiana do you come from? Right. Oh, oh you're from California. Who elected, what office do you, oh, you weren't elected to office, so you're not elected to any office, you don't come from Indiana, and you're telling me I have to overturn the decision that was ratified by the elected officials of the state of Indiana. Arrest this man. Officer, arrest this man. He's overthrowing the government. And do you know what happened after that? They handed the bill over to the guy, I forget his name, who was former mayor of uh, Indianapolis, who was now working for Eli Lilly. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. You mean the big corporations have succeeded representative government? They're the people who make the laws now. And that's Pete Buttigieg. That, that is exactly who he represents. You know, I, I talk to reporters, I've talked to a lot of reporters, and what I always tell them is South Bend is like the movie Hunger Games. You know, there's certain areas that if you're within the walled city of South Bend, you know, you have those jobs, mm -hmm. the high paying jobs. You have all the nice Starbucks that you can go to. You have the disco lights that you enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Mike calls them disco lights. The, the gay disco. The, the gay disco <laughs> lights. It, one of the things he did was lit up the, the bridge over the river. Who, who thought that was an improvement? Um, but the reality is these things were done to benefit the upper class where the, the caste system is firmly in place. 1.7 billion in public works mm -hmm. projects that were done there are no black construction contractors. So if you want to address the 36% poverty and the 24% double-digit black unemployment, you would think, well, you want to certainly be able to give some of this money uh, to black contractors who can then turn around and employ minorities. But you also have a school system that, has a, that allows you to play football and baseball and sports with a 1.6 grade average. So it's telling you we have this caste system. It's okay. And, and, the, and the black people have been replaced by a new revolutionary avant-garde, and that is the homosexual. Who, who don't care for the black people at all. Could, no, and could so they're you're Leave them freezing the in the street. But one, one thing I like, that, that, that what Bob was saying, who was referencing Mike, that Buttigieg is acting on what he believes, okay? So what do I believe about what he believes? Well, he's number one in his class at St. Joe High School which unfortunately I believe he was taught evolution and he went to Harvard and I know he was taught radical evolution there mm -hmm. and the, the, the black well, and Stanley Clark I understand he went to Stanley Clark was a private school and learned before he the, went to St. Joe before he went to St. Joe and that wouldn't have been Christian yeah. well it, it's as Mike said Mike mm -hmm. said that he's the kid that sat in the window during the summer he, he never interacted with the, the, the lower class people. He, I mean, I'm on that block. Yeah, I, I know, and you're- I have, you're, fi I have five kids. And you're, two They're of your all, sons went to Harvard. No, one, one son, went the down. oldest son went to Harvard. He said, yeah. in his book, he said, I was really interested in Harvard. I'm a local guy. Well, Pete, my son went to Harvard before you went. He lived two houses down from, with four houses down from where you lived. Why didn't you make contact with him? The answer is very simple. He was not allowed to because his father didn't want his son contaminated by associating with people like my children. And so as a result, he spent a lot of time, it's in the book, at the dinner table talking with the radical professors at Notre Dame who were students of Antonio Gramsci, who was a communist, 
of Michel Foucault, yeah. and these were the people, state-of-the-art philosophers of revolution. They were the ones who explained how you can take over a conservative society from within, like Italy or like Notre Dame. Yeah. And that's his father, that's what his father did. And so he learned that lesson and now he's applying it to South Bend. You, you know, we had, before you got here, and I, I know when I mentioned Gunnar Myrdal before, you were saying that that book was ghostwritten, and I want to say that, but the, 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 uh, what he wrote, uh, you, you got to understand that I think Pete Buttigieg understand it, particularly because he's, what he's done is co -op, he's trying to co-op black support by going right after people he designates as black leaders. Not that are popularly designated as black leaders, but he'll come and say, okay, you're the black leader. And, and, and so when the media, when he, well, this is a black leader, no one ever said he's a black. And, you, you know, to have an elected official, one of the city council people, and that's an interesting thing. You got one city council person that's going around the country supporting him. But in his eight years, there were five black, excuse me, five black city council people. Four of them won't support him. So 80% of the black city council people on his tenure don't support him. One person does. But, but the, the point is, if you look at uh, the, the, the uh, American Dilemma, it talked about how the, the, black, the dynamics of the black community. There are no high paying jobs here. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you, you hand pick you know, two or three black leaders, you elevate them, even if they're not qualified, you give them a high paying job. And so you have people say, I want a high paying job. Well, you don't have to earn it. All you have to do is go tell the other peons that I'm really good to black people. And that's why it doesn't move the meter nationwide. Because other people look at that and they go, well, we've seen that in the American Dilemma with, you know, Gunnar Myrdal, that that's what you're doing. He's well, sitting down with Reverend Sharpton and having a chicken dinner with the hot sauce visible, and then later on a 40 ounce in a paper bag is... <laughs> that was, that was... Well, that yeah, was. But, but who would do that but an oligarch? Who would do that but a kid who sat in the window? Anyone who played outside understand that... that you don't connect with people that way. But, but that is an oligarch. You have a caste system that is set up here. And he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to show care and concern. As a pastor, that's what my concern is. I see the, the, the moral damage that he's doing to, to lower class, black, white, Hispanic people in this city. I see it on a regular basis. I see people come in that have frostbitten fingers because they have no place to go. We fed last year from December 3rd to April 15th 4,000 hot meals. We have a small poor you, church. You know how he dealt with this when he held his uh, uh, launch of his national campaign and the press conference sure. down there? He rounded up the homeless people. They, yeah. were, they were under that bridge yeah. there, yeah. you know. Uh, national media is coming into town to get to that place, that factory that with the leaky roof. Yeah. They had to go right under that bridge. Well, there were all these homeless people inside. He rounded them up. He cleaned it up. He had code enforcement and the police this come is, in. This was his solution to the homeless yeah. problem. Round Smash them up. Smash their stuff and dump it in a dump. <laughs> but what I see, the solution is what I see, I think you said it on the show there, uh, the, the clip, is that one way to, like, discipline, let's take school is an easy one. If you have Christians in the school working, you know, ministering, maybe subtly or ministry, right. well, you don't need the police, okay? But once you remove the Christian out, guess what? You got to put police this, in. So this, the Constitution, John Adams said, our Constitution uh, uh, demands a moral people. In other words, you cannot have self-government unless you can govern yourself. Yeah. And what you're saying is that you are not governing. You've given in to these, these de demonic homosexual yes. passions. You yes. brag about them. Yes. And then you expect everyone else to pay their taxes and, and, uh, and park on the right side of the street when you're violating one of the most fundamental principles of the natural law? It doesn't work that way. It well, doesn't work that way. But what he does is try and co-opt the scriptures to make it seem like, well, I'm a Christian and God made me this way. Which is, which is, when you talk about Christians, so now you have the, um, uh, as Paul said, the Christians that are still on milk saying, well, he's a Christian. And I, I saw some comment on Facebook, you know, God bless Mayor Buttigieg. And I, I thought, 
Well, God doesn't bless sin. Well, you can't, uh, you, he, you he, can't leave the show without at least saying that St. Paul said, if anybody says he's a brother or yes, a Christian, yes. and yet is living a sexually immoral yes. life, he said, You're, you cannot have you company fellowship. with them, and well, you're not even allowed to eat he, with them. I th I think there, when he said that, he gave that little speech you put, oh, about God made me this way, and it posted on YouTube, and the first comment is, don't blame God, you faggot. <laughs> Yeah, I know. And then, it was, it, so then Chaston does something similar, and all the comments are disabled. Yeah. So this is the, the, this was the voice of the people uh, protesting against his abuse of scripture. We have to bring ourselves back to reality here in the fact, state the fact that this not one vote has been cast. Yeah. And what we're seeing here is the media and the oligarchs uh, pushing people aside, sure. like Tulsi Gabbard just got pushed out of yeah. the whole thing because she's not saying, and then this man with all of his money is being promoted as the man we're supposed to choose. Guess what? It's exactly what happened with the police chief in South Bend. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. They gave us three candidates from completely out of this city and saying, oh, you're free to choose. Yeah. The same thing has happened with the primary, Democratic primary. They're telling us who we have to choose, Absolutely. and they're, they're naming the front runners according to their criteria and the money that they're raising. Not one vote. This is an attack on representative government yeah. once again. Yeah, yeah no, th th that's another point that we didn't talk about, how much influence the media has, you know. Well, he silenced the media yeah. here. The media here is effectively censored. It's effectively censored. Well, what were you saying? Yeah, but the national media has set the tone. Yeah. And, and, um, and as Mike has said, they're, um, <clears throat> like when you play a game um, as an adult, you can stack the deck. You can make the odds in your favor. Sure you can put up two or three candidates that you know no one wants. Right. And you have a unqualified person Absolutely. who will be the only one left, who's the one that you're really pushing, which is what happened with the Teachman, exactly. you know, there, exactly. you know. That's, that's how he came here. Exactly. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> to our viewers, like it may appear that we're uh, bashing Mayor Pete. We are not bashing Mayor Pete. We are bringing out some facts. Absolutely. And these facts are something that the voters have to consider when they go to the polls. Amen. So um, uh, said, just so listen to your conscience. Um, um, be well founded in your facts and um, and Peter's going to give us some closing just remarks. Closing remarks. I'm thinking uh, on the other hand I do thank Mayor Pete because he's the one that enabled us to uh, right. he put the vote in to have public access. Okay. okay so weigh the facts like Bob says and um, these things are important. So this is uh, Peter Helland with uh, my, uh, Dr. Jones, Mario Sims, and Dr. Smith on Citizens for Community Media. God bless.